you for attending today. We're back here again because every time you look at this budget, you get deeper and deeper. You really find that this budget is simply a sham, and that's what it is. These have this budget has illegitimate numbers, purposely misleading numbers that obviously will result in a deficit a year from now. And probably most importantly, it's going to hurt the state of Connecticut, and I would argue the families in the state of Connecticut. Well, we talked about the last time, looking at the board, we had $458 million of contracts that didn't exist. Now we're talking about $180 million that, of money that's being added to consensus revenue, an absolute violation of a law that was passed under Governor Rell that the Democrats passed to make sure that we all use the same numbers. And the last part about the budget is finding the $50 million that in the second part of the budget says the OPM secretary has to find $50 million of new fees and revenue generators to balance the budget. So you're almost at $700 million in debt as we stand here now. And because of that, once again, we call upon this governor not to sign a sham budget. The hypocrisy, the hypocrisy can't be any more apparent than what we've seen. In 2008, 2009, when Governor Rell did her budget, the issue was that Governor Rell was using figures that were not realistic because they did not match OFA. And the Democrats decided with their majority and overriding a veto by Governor Rell, they decided to change the methodology for budgeting and said, we are going to use consensus revenue where OPM and OFA get together and decide on what the revenue is for the next two years based upon current law. And that is the basis for which we will use for budgeting. And then you do pluses and minuses from that relative to the changes in your tax law. To, and I'll point out, Keith Vanoff did this back in 2015, I think it was, doing how consensus revenue works to create a budget. And that's an accurate display. What the Democrats did was to take consensus revenue and add $90 million more revenue for a total of $180 million over the next two years without any policy change. And how did they do that? What they did is they took withholding that OFA put at 4% and they added 1.5% for the next two years. Why? No policy reason, just because they wanted to. That is in complete and absolute violation of the very statute that through their majority they passed. If you look at this board, Governor Lamont, when he did his budget, talked about an increase of 2.7 and 2.2. Consensus revenue talked about 4.0 and 4.0. In the budget, it went up to 5.5 to 5.5. That's what they did. There is no procedure for which you can change consensus revenue. It's never been done in the 10 years that we've been in this building and this law passed. We have laws because you have to follow the law. And when you don't follow the law, something is wrong. The Democrats bill that they passed, we talk about transparency in government, talk about transparency in budgeting. Governor Lamont had indicated that we're gonna have a very transparent policy and a transparent budget, neither of which we have seen in this budget. Nothing has been transparent. Clearly, the numbers have not. Now, I called the OFA and talked to Neil and asked him about these numbers, and he knew that they exist, but he's not ready or willing, as OFA, to agree that the number should be 5.5. So, adding 180 million, the only argument that I can see for doing that, they couldn't balance the budget. 
That's why you have to find $50 million in year two. You can't balance the budget. So you make up numbers. <coughs> and you try to tell the people of Connecticut that's honest budgeting. I humbly disagree with that very notion. And no matter what the argument was, no matter what people say they believe that number was, the bottom line is we use consensus data. <coughs> that's how we operate this building. I would also add, not once, did you hear, did anybody here on the floor of the House, the floor of the Senate, when the budget was announced, that, oh, by the way, just in full transparency, we deviated for the first time in 10, year, ten, ten years from consensus revenue. You didn't see that admission. And if you looked at what happened in finance, it was the first time ever they gave the data in a different format. Usually they show 2019 then the 20, then the 21, so you could find it. They didn't do that this year. Why? Because they didn't want you to know. They didn't want you to know that they hit the number. If you're gonna do it, fess up and say, oh, by the way, we decided to have $90 million. This is why. We're standing up and telling you. Why would Why wouldn't you? So, we think, based upon all those things we mentioned, the fact that Moore's, Moody's rather, says we believe there's a recession coming, and Barnes thinks that there's a recession coming. I had a conversation with Don Klepper Smith, you all remember him, the uh, advisor to Governor Rell and the well known economist, well respected, to see what his numbers His numbers were pretty close to Governor Lamont's numbers. He believes that. So we have to support the high numbers on withholding. If anybody thinks that the state of Connecticut is going to have a 9.5% increase each of the next two years, I don't know what world they're living in. It's not the world I see. It's not the GEP that's been in the negative. We haven't recovered the jobs from 2008, only 80 some odd percent. This is very bad for the state of Connecticut. Unfortunately, this is what happens when you have one party rule. So, if there are any questions, I would Yeah, wait, I, wait a minute. What, 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 law, what law requires you guys to use consensus estimates? Because my understanding is you, you're not required to use consensus yes. estimates for budgets, right? Yeah, yes, budgets, sure. budgets, have been adopt, budgets have been adopted that have, have estimated more taxes than, than were in the, in the, in the I, yeah. No, that's that's also, there's a difference. Let me explain the way well, consensus. Well, no, well, did, did can, I explain, saying, yeah, can I explain uh, consensus revenue in a way? I it understand is. consensus revenue. I'm asking you. I don't believe consensus revenue require the law requires that you use those consensus revenue estimates in your budget. You can you can as a legislature decide how much taxes you think you're going to collect next okay. year. So let me explain it this way. This is the way it works. Like when you appraise a house, you look at a house that's sold. You say that's the fair market value of the house. So when you want to appraise your house, they say. What's the square footage relative to that house? Does it have an extra bedroom? Is it a finished basement? And you take that house and you do minuses and plus. That's what consensus revenue does. The law says that the legislature shall and the executive branch shall use consensus revenue as the basis. Then from there, you put your policies in to say, if we tax this, we add more revenue. If we do this, credit, we subtract, but you start from a common place. That's why Don Williams and the Democrats did that, because REL wasn't starting from a common place. So there was no way to judge it. So they said, let's get OPM and OFA together and then decide by the comptroller of what consensus revenue is. So we all agree to a number. From there, you do your budgeting off of that, that goes up and down. But you don't take consensus revenue and add to it. To that fact, I asked OFA, that very question and said, it's my understanding that you take consensus revenue and you add your policies up or down, and that's how you get your budget. And he said, yes. The only time consensus revenue ever changed in 10 years was one time, Paul. And that was a time where there was an issue of agencies collecting fees or collecting penalties, and they would say to OFA, you know, we've added another person, you may want to up that number, or we've collected our maximum, you may want to put that number down. Other than that agency internal comment, 
It's never been changed with respect to economic outlook. Here is the first time in 10 years it's been changed as an economic outlook. And I challenge you to tell you that the statute says the legislature and the executive branch will look at that number to formulate the budget. Well, uh, if, if, if not, well, okay. well, and also, this, these weren't a surprise because uh, OPM Secretary uh, McCall publicly confirmed that the revenue estimates included an assumption of a growth rate of 5% in the 2020 and 5.5% in 2021. So this is this is not something that was done never, in a, secretly. Well, I can tell you because I asked okay. and I reported on it. Okay, I this have is, never this seen is not new I information. Never, I have never seen that, and I've never seen consensus revenue change. Well, and you look at the revenue. By look the way, at, if you increase the withholding, not on the consensus revenue, but if you say, I'm going to increase withholding, so I'm going to add that later, they took the consensus revenue and they increased it. It wasn't a tax policy. Paul, I, I understand you're saying that they didn't, they didn't provide a policy justification for their assumption in the growth, but they're assuming based on what they're seeing, that it's going to be growing. Because if you look at OPM's last report, they're saying that withholding taxes were running 434.4 million, uh, 44, 430 .4 million over the budgeted amount, you know, which comes to about 7% over what was the adopted level, and 6.5% over, I believe, what was the uh, April 30th number. So given those numbers, is, are those assumed rates out of line? Yeah, I think those rates, if, I, I didn't catch all your numbers, I'll be honest with you, okay. just pulled off pretty fast, so I don't want to okay. say Okay. Well, I will say what I can talk about is the fact that we've never not used consensus revenue to this year. And the whole idea of consensus revenue, if OPM believed very strongly that the number should be 5.5, they should have taken that up with OFA, and if she didn't agree, it would have gone to the comptroller for a final decision. Let's be clear, OFA and OPM agreed to the consensus revenue figure. They said this is it. That was what was published on April 30th according to law. If OPM said it should be higher, they had an obligation to make that argument at that time, and if they couldn't agree, then that argument goes to the comptroller. But you don't have a right under our laws to say, I'm gonna agree just for the purpose of getting it out of here, but then I'm gonna change it later. That violates the law, and I object to that law. Okay. So Clearly. Senator, when, when you, um, the, Paul rightly suggests the income tax withholding has been performing very well under the current budget. Why wouldn't you think this would happen, especially if you're a loyal Republican under the Trump wonderful economy? Well, first of all, under Trump wonderful economy, the federal government has decreased the withholding to keep the money in the economy. That's why their economy is doing better. That's number one. Connecticut is the opposite. It is going up. But if you look at the revenue increases, none of it has to do with withholding. If you look at why the money has gone up, it has to do with withholding. It has nothing to do with withholding. So those increases, though, plus withholding, and you've got the point you're withholding is you're paying money to the government for your taxes for which you get back if you don't incur those taxes. Withholding's not a plus side to the state. Look, I understand the state wants to take as much money, your money, as they can and use it as a float. I kind of get that because that's what government does, wrongly so, is take your money. But Let's be clear, withholding is not a revenue generator. And the taxes have gone up, but it's not been because of withholding. Well, in, in the last part of your presentation, you said that something about uh, nobody expects a 9.5% increase over the next two years. Isn't that 11%? 11%. Yeah. Yes, it's 11%. You're right. Well, yeah. um, Secretary McCaw said that by the time they were getting toward the end of May, OPM would was tracking withholding growth over 7.2%. Um, I had asked her about possibly should the, the CR date be moved, but now that we have the volatility cap and we, we have the revenue cap so we budget for a surplus, are we at a point where perhaps we don't need the CR? I'm, I'm just throwing out a question to everybody. Should this be well, um, I will say this moved, if, adjusted, or repealed? If, if the new way of budgeting is OPM and OFA to get together and come to a consensus revenue on April 30th, and 30 days later ignore what their agreement is, then I don't know why we have it. Remember why we got this. We got this because Don Williams and the Democratic majority, and you remember because you covered it extensively, said we need consensus revenue because everyone's got to start as a commonplace. That's what was said. That's why we have it. If we're going to ignore it, then they should have re re revoked the bill when they did the budget. 
But I find it very disheartening to think the Democrats in hypocrisy, the Democrats who really wanted it when there was a Republican governor, now say, well, you know, we're in charge, rules change. And this is what we're supposed to be doing in this building, as far as I know. I think we're supposed to follow the law. Have you contacted the governor? I mean, what have your communications been? I mean, now what? Now you're, you're pointing this out, fact or not, but now what? Look, the issue is with the minority party, the best we can do is point out that you're running a budget that has these holes in it. We have further contacted uh, Dan Livingston, and you saw that letter that I got back from Dan Livingston. Basically said, we don't agree to anything in your letter, and we don't, we don't agree to any, any assertions in your letter or any statements in your letter. When I asked him on the 450, here are three questions I have for you. It's a game. It's just a game. And I object to it being a game. These are people's lives at risk. This is the state of Connecticut at risk. This is a question of if they don't get the 450, who's going to pay for it? If they don't get the 180, who's going to pay for it? If they don't get the 50, who's going to pay for it? And if you look at the budget, it may not come out of the municipal because they excluded that. And it may not come out of education because they excluded that. And oh, by the way, they added a whole bunch of pet projects that the money's not going to come out of. So it's going to come out of other areas that aren't protected, who don't have people in this building watching their back. But someone's going to pay for that $700 million. Now, maybe they'll get some of the savings off the TERS that I think they probably don't need approval, but Dan Livingston wouldn't even admit that. The bottom line is this budget isn't balanced. That's the bottom line. And the bottom line is you can't cover that debt. And the bottom line is, we had enough budgets that ran into deficit every single year, and people paid for it, Connecticut residents. And last year, the bipartisan budget was the first time we had a budget that stayed positive all the way through, without gimmickry, without legislative mitigation, without governor coming in and interceding. It had a natural surplus, which they've taken away with this budget, all of the surplus entirely. But nevertheless, it had a surplus. And it was something we did because we used real numbers with real thought and real conversations. We didn't do a one-party budget and rip something out and say, it's on time and in budget. Aren't we great patting ourselves in the back? It takes time to do a good product. And if they want to do it the way they want to do it, they're welcome to do it. They're the majority. But I'm going to call them out on it. Should the governor, we'll see the errors. So. Should, should the governor um, line item veto? I don't know, the raises to the legislative branch? I think they should line on veto that. I think they should line on veto the covenant not to compete that they stuck in there for the home care workers. I think there's a lot of stuff you should line on veto out of that budget. Well, if you I think they should scrap this budget and we should start again. That's what I think. And give people in the room who can say, what about this and what about that? If you have like-minded people all in the room, you're not going to get the diversity that's required in a budget. And that's what's happening right now. And that's what's happened before our, our bipartisan budget. You never had a conversation like we had. You all were there when we took from, what, uh, from May till November to get a budget. And I think we got it right. I think we got it right. Well, you got that budget done under the gun. I mean, the real reason you got that budget done was because Governor Malloy was going to withhold $500 million in education cost-sharing funding. Please, please, Paul, don't say that because you covered it as much I as... I covered it. Yes, right. I did. And, and, we, that's, and that's, that's what, thing, seemed, to, that's what seemed to break things. And everybody went back there and said, there's no way Republicans and Democrats are going to come to a budget. If I heard that from you guys once, I heard a hundred times. Hear from and me. every time we went to a press conference, it was, you guys really going to make a deal? You're really going to make a deal? You're not going to make a deal? Oh, you're not going to do it? And we put together a budget. And we, we put it together because we're 1818. And had nothing, we kicked Malloy out of the room. You did. Right? Because we knew to put a budget together, we couldn't have him in the room. And we put it together on his budget. And it took time. If we were under the gun, we would have done it, oh, we got to get it done by July 30th or August 2nd. We did it when we were ready, and we knew what we'd done, and we put a good product together. And we took our time. We didn't rush it as much as we got pressure from everybody. We refused to rush that budget. Because more importantly, to do it right than to do it on time. And I would argue the same thing here. It's more importantly to do it right than to do it on time. And we are very proud of the bipartisan budget that we put out. And you guys see the benefits of it. It's allowing that tourist thing to be refinanced, but for our budget. It's allowing for them to use money in the, in the budget deficit that they have in 20 and 21. So 
So our budget does a lot of good things that they're going to get the benefit of, which is okay. But don't go down the path that we've done for 40 years in this building. Let's do something different. Just because the numbers are lopsided doesn't mean you can't have conversations. Just because you have a majority doesn't mean you have to show your muscle and your strength. You have, an, I would argue, a greater obligation to bring people together just because you are the majority. Yeah. Uh, another topic, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, in less than an hour, he's going to sign the Payne Family and Medical Lead Act. Uh, do you still have problems with that? Do you still predict that it's not going to be able to generate enough money and that, so, the, fees and that the withholding tax is going to have to go up? So once again, this is a mandatory bill that's taking money out of people's pockets starting in October. They're already taking money out of their, before their taxes, I might add, money out of their pocket because government knows better than you how to spend your money. Government knows that you don't do it right, so we got to coddle you and we got to take care of you and we're going to start by taking that money out of your pocket because we can. That's just wrong, Mark. It's a wrong philosophy. We put forth a paid family leave because we believe in it. And we put forth one that allowed the insurance companies to put together a product, and people have a right to make a decision for themselves, not let government tell them that we know better than them what's better for themselves. So you still believe that it's not going to raise enough money? Hey, you know, Mark, here's the other joke about the thing, right? Paid family leave, they promise all these wonderful things, except if they don't reach the target, they're going to take away some of those wonderful things that they promise you. It's another promise we make in this building that we know we can't uphold. And if I may, even Governor Lamont said, if we don't have it as a private run by a private entity, I'm not sure it can survive. He's even very pessimistic about the math. Even in the bill, they're pessimistic about the math because they say if it doesn't work out, we're going to take benefits away. So no, I don't think it is going to work. Washington's having a problem, state of Washington's having a problem, Massachusetts is having a problem. All of a sudden, we're not going to have a problem. And we have the most liberal policy when it comes to paid family leave. The most liberal. Because we promise and promise and promise. And then when it's done, we say, well, maybe we can't do that as much as we wanted to. Let people make their own decisions. They can control their own lives. Have a little faith in humanity. I don't think government's the answer to everything. Because that's what they think. So they're taking money out of your pocket today for something you may get in two years. What that is, we don't know yet. If it's going to work, we're not sure. But if it doesn't, don't worry about it. We'll take away the benefits that you thought you were getting when you agreed that this was a good idea. Any other questions? You have about tolls. You want to talk about tolls now, too? Tolls. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, he, no, no, I just, we talked to the governor yesterday, there didn't seem to be even a firm date for your follow-up meeting, so. There wasn't it. a firm date for okay. the follow-up meeting. I will say this, Paul, uh, yeah. we got the PowerPoint, yeah. well, we didn't get it from the governor's office till at, we have, after the press conference was over. We got the PowerPoint. We have gone over the PowerPoint in greater detail, um, and we're looking at solutions. This isn't one that we will sit back and say no without trying to figure out a methodology. Um, there's a lot there, and we have to digest it. We'll be meeting with uh, DOT and OPM about questions that we've already generated. But it's going to take, I mean, this is a big issue. It's going to take a lot for us to get our arms around it. But uh, there will be a follow-up meeting. It is a good late follow-up. Uh, that's not our plan. Did they suggest the week of the 8th? No one's available starting. Well, that's for special session. No, I heard, no, 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 for, 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 for so. no one's contacted me on anything. But that's so I still need time on oh, that. Sorry, so. just to me that there be sorry. Sorry. Well, a video session will be the What he does, which makes it so impressive. Uh, so that's news to us. Paul, well, you weren't uh, watching my my stories. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. I said it was Thank you very much. Come to the Tri Brook Beer Company on Monday. <laughs> <laughs>